Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Austin Christian Fellowship. My name is John David. This is Sarah, and this is Abby. We're uh, so excited to lead you in worship this morning. Let's stand to our feet as we praise God together. Amen.
sing of your goodness, I will sing of your love. Though the seasons come quickly, you have always been enough. Though the night may get darker, though the waiting seems long, you have always been faithful to remind me of your love. You
tried so hard to see it It took me so long to believe it That you choose someone like me To carry your victory Perfection could never earn it You give what we don't
Let's lift our hands this morning in exaltation of the Lord. We magnify your name, Jesus, above every other name. We say that you're the only one found worthy. We bless your name. Oh, we bless your name. Oh, Jesus, because you're the name. Cause you're the name above all names. You are worthy of all praise. In my heart, come on, church, let your anthem arise. Is the name above?
Jesus, you have the name that is above every name, that at your name, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. God, there's still healing in your name. There's still power in your name. There's still deliverance and freedom in your name. There is salvation only in the name of Jesus Christ. You're the Lord of lords. You're the King of kings. You're the beginning and the end. You're the one and only true living God. There is none besides you, Jesus. We exalt and magnify you in this place today. It's in your mighty name that we pray, Jesus. Amen. Come on, one more time. Lift up a mighty shout unto the Lord. Welcome to Austin Christian Fellowship. God bless you guys. Greetings, friends. How you guys doing today? You guys well? Man. Okay, so um, just not to cut to the chase, but I want you to remember that moment we just had, because I'm going to come back to it in a few minutes, the way you just felt as we sang and were exhorted by John David and our worship leaders to give more to God and what happened in this room when you did that. I want you to hang on to that, that memory, because I'm going to come back to it in a minute and talk about what, what just happened. Greetings again. My name is Will Davis, Jr. Welcome to Austin Christian Fellowship. It's so great to see all of you. I want to greet especially you guys online and my friends and family out there. It is so good to see you. Um, welcome. We're glad to have you as well. At any point in this service, you guys online or you guys here in the room, if you'll text ACF Connect, the phrase ACF Connect to 512-866-9908. For questions about our church, for ways to connect, for prayer requests, for giving information, for student ministry and children ministry, et cetera, it's prayer, whatever prayer requests, whatever you like to know more about, we can respond to you immediately and we'd love to do so. Holidays are approaching, a new year is approaching, uh, there's a lot going on, especially in holidays, people deal with mixed emotions this time of year. Don't walk this out alone. Everybody needs a church, even non believers need a church. And let us be yours. This is a great group of people. You guys are an amazing group of people. And it's such an honor to be associated with you. And so um, if you're flying solo out there, we'd love to be your place where you hang out. Um, let me invite you back for Thanksgiving service next weekend. Can you believe Thanksgiving is Thursday? I mean, like, I'm still celebrating July 4th in my brain, and Thanksgiving is this weekend. Like, what happened? And so have a great week. Travel safely. Be careful. If you're in town, please come next weekend. We're going to conclude this series called The Sound with a Thanksgiving service, The Sound of Thanksgiving. And it's going to be kind of a scripted walk you through a Thanksgiving event with great music and some testimonies and some stories that will make you celebrate and weep all at the same time. And um, some scriptural exhortations and some prayers. It'll be a little different than this service typically is because we're going to try to lead you as a congregation much in biblical fashion in just an hour of telling God how much we appreciate all he's done for us in the past year. And it will be good for your spirit. So I hope you'll be here um, for that as well. Let me pray. Thank you, Lord, for this amazing time and for the really powerful moments we had with you just a few minutes ago. There's more than singing going on here, God, and we thank you for that. I ask you, Lord, to bless our wonderful friends and family and guests online today as they seek you out. I pray you give them hope and encouragement and courage as they seek you. Pray for protection on them um, during the holidays and on us as well as a church. I pray your blessings and your protection on this nation, your healing on this nation and this city. And I pray churches like Austin Christian Fellowship and, and so many great ones that are in the city and around the country will rise up and preach your word and love people and serve the least of these and be generous and declare how great is our God to the world. 
Lord, I want to pray today for my brothers and sisters in Kenya, who I got to know a few weeks ago. I'm thinking of, dream about them every night, Lord. It's so easy to get myopic in our approach to the kingdom. Your kingdom's really big. And there are people that started doing church really early this morning over in Kenya that might just still be going. Bless them today. Meet, meet their needs, Lord. In that little village in Segura, send rain to them, Lord, as they desperately need it. Now, Lord, I pray you'd humble me and activate my skills and gifts and teach through me in this time. And thank you for what's going to happen today. We pray this in your name. Amen. Matthew 26, if you want to turn there, I'm going to offer you lots of scriptures. Feel free as you want also to take notes, take pictures of the screen. We send you notes if you request them as well from what I'm teaching. Love it when you do that. We're in the next to last week of this series called The Sound. I love the video which shows music but nature at the same time. I talked last week about how heaven and nature sing together and how we have an opportunity to join in with heaven and nature with our own worship and how we're talking about how singing is more than singing. And if you didn't hear last week's message, let me encourage you to go back and listen to it because it's kind of the precursor to this one. It's kind of, that was kind of part one. This is kind of part two. As there's a, lo- a lot more going on than when we just sing. There's, there's things that happen. It's a, it's, a, it's a biblical love language. It's a biblical language. And I'm, I'm not, I'm pretty convinced it's the language of heaven. Is music and song. When heaven leaks, and it does, it typically comes out in musical fashion. So in Matthew 26, verse 30, the scene is Passover, dinner, becoming communion. It's just a few hours before the arrest of Jesus, and he's celebrating his final Passover meal with his disciples. Judas has left to uh, betray him, and they finish Passover, and in classic Hebrew fashion, verse 30, after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. There's some of these verses you're tended to just kind of skip over, like, okay, well, that's really cool. I want you to think about the Lord Jesus with now 11 disciples, not 12, knowing that he's going to leave that upper room and cross down the Kidron Valley and go up to the Mount of Olives to the Garden of Gethsemane, about a 30-minute walk, and in a matter of hours be arrested and enter into that, that chaos of death that he was going to go into. And in the hours before that, he is singing. Imagine those strong male Hebrew voices singing from probably Psalm 118 but the goodness of God. Even in the confusion, where is Judas gone? Why is our Lord so heavy? With this, we've kind of, it's been a weird week, and, but we're going to sing. And I told you last week that singing marks so much of the scriptural history and, and the history of the church. Singing is a big part of that. It's a big part of what we do, as you just noticed. If you're new to church, there's a lot of singing going on. I remember pastoring years ago and having a guy show up that didn't go to church, and he said, you guys sing a lot. <laughs> yeah, we do. There's a, but there's a reason for that. We're not trying to kill time. It's not warm-up. It's not prelude. The Apostle Paul commanded, I'll read you the verses in a minute, but the Apostle Paul commanded that we sing. It's part of the, the backdrop of the church, of the Christian life, is to be singing. I encouraged you last week, and I hope you've done it this week, to mark moments with singing. Good and bad. Sing in your grief, sing in your joy. Sing in promotions, sing in graduations, sing in passings of loved ones. Mark, because singing elevates the moment to a higher level than just speaking does. It it shifts things. You know that. Excuse me. So what I want to do is, is, is put the phrase on the screen, when you sing, dot, 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 and talk about what happens when we sing. And I mean this today a little bit in the plural, because there's a lot that happens when I sing. Um, it's perhaps better when we sing. And so I want to talk to the church 
today. The church gathered. I want to talk to you guys online who are having to do church for whatever reason right now more in, in isolation and maybe encourage you to think about breaking out of that isolation at some point if you can. Because there's something very powerful that happens when a group gathered in the name of the king sings. Okay? When you sing dot, 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 you encourage your full self. There's, there's something that happens in the innermost you when you sing that doesn't happen in other settings or in other forms of communication. These are some of the verses I mentioned earlier. Ephesians, the third chapter. If you don't know Ephesians chapter 3, get familiar with it. It's amazing. Verse 14 says, For this reason I bend my knees. This is the Apostle Paul writing to Christians in Ephesus. I bend my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner self that you might that Christ might dwell in your hearts through faith i want to dwell on that phrase the inner self for just a moment because singing affects the inner self singing moves past the cerebral and connects the emotional You are a cerebral being. You're also an emotional being. You are a trichotomy before God. You are a body. Actually, you're a soul and a spirit that have a body. You're not really a body. The body is a container. But while you're here, you're in the flesh and you move in the flesh. And so fleshliness and tangibility is part of what we deal with. There's also limitations to that. Your mind is not as limited, nor is your spirit, nor is that, that emotional, volitional side of you that can will past your circumstances. And so I can say to you, how great is our God? Or I can sing to you, how great is our God? And there's a difference in how it moves you. When you say, how great is our God? Versus planting your feet and declaring in song, how great is our God, as we did a moment ago. And you can thank me now for not demonstrating that for you. Just, I'm, you notice I'm not doing that. I want to preserve the Holy Spirit in the room as long as I can. There's a, there's a difference between saying it and singing it. There's even a difference when we sing it versus when I sing it alone. There's something about that corporate de- declaration and song that raises the, the, the emotional intensity, and that's good. It's not fake emotion. What it's doing is it's pulling in your whole self. The, the message, the sermon, tends to be primarily cerebral. I, I'm here to make you think, and God will move past your mind in appropriate times of the sermon into your spirit, into your gut, and awaken you, and you'll feel things emotionally when I preach. That's the Holy Spirit. Singing kind of bypasses the mind and goes right to the gut and, and, and encourages, awakens that full self. And we are to worship with, as a trichotomy. The scriptures say, we are to, Jesus said, my father is seeking those who worship him in spirit and in truth. It's a spiritual act, worship is. It's not just a physical act. It, can, it is physical, but it's more than that. And what singing does is it engages all of you. So again, why I've talked in this series, why music at, at, at concerts that have nothing to do with God is so powerful. Music events are so powerful. Music is so, such a powerful medium because it's, it represents the greater reality of what's going on in heaven, but it connects with something in you that's deeper than your brain. The brain, my humble opinion, scripturally based, is not the end all. The spirit is. That which is created in the image of God is the ultimate end all. And it is your spirit that will prevail into eternity. So when you sing, you engage your full self. So I want to say to those of you who are not a fan of music, you're missing a major third of you is missing out when you don't worship. And forgive me, I didn't say that well. You can worship without singing. You can totally worship without singing. But there's something about singing that reflects the realities of heaven that engages you in a way that other forms of worship do not. We are commanded to sing. We 
are commanded to sing. When you sing dot, 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 you learn God's word. I love this one. Because so much of what we sing is God's word. Well, let's just say this. What you sing, you learn. Right? I mean, if I started some lyrics to songs, okay? Welcome to the Hotel California. What would you say? Welcome to the jungle? Seriously? Welcome to the... Hotel California. See, it's terrible. I just brought a satanic song into church. Yeah, there goes the Holy Spirit. Yeah, he, he's gone. I, I kept him here as long as I could. The Holy Spirit just left the building. I have no idea where we are. I lost my train of thought. I'm dead in the water. I quoted the eagles in church, and we're gone. When, whatever you sing, you learn. So when we sing songs about, remember I taught you last week that often much of the New Testament is just hymns lifted from the catacombs and the churches and dropped into the the scriptures because it was familiar to them. So much of what we sing in scripture was already sung. The Psalms, the Psalms are songs. So when you sing something, it has an ability to kind of get into your memory because again, it's connecting with your spirit much more than just trying to recite scripture. I can memorize scripture, but when I sing it, it's easier. It's just natural. So Paul said in uh, Colossians, this third chapter, verse, three, verse, verse 16, he said, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. This is the command. With all wisdom and teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Plural, you sing, y'all sing. You guys sing. Because when you do that, you teach the word. When you sing the hymns and songs that we do, you teach doctrine. You teach scripture. You teach biblical truths. How great is our God? We just learned that through song. Sing with me. How great is our God? We just declared that through song. And when you declare it through song, it kind of sets in you in a way, because some of you have told me this, I know this, I do it, I, I'm here both services, I wake up in the middle of the week singing the songs we sing here on Sunday. I wake up in the morning in my brain. That's not a bad thing to wake up to. We're gonna sing a song in a minute that is one of my favorites right now, and it just, it just gets in me, it just gets in me. But it, what it teaches, so that's why Paul said I want you to sing because it teaches things. So I'm not, I, trust me, I listen and play hard along with really great secular music. I just love music, and I'm an old 70s and early 80s rock and roll guy, and I'm not ashamed of it. I love music, but I am very focused about renewing my mind sometimes with, with, with songs that sing about truth and declare, because they teach me. I learn things when I sing along with, with worship. So, uh, I don't know her name. I, I, I forget her name. There's a school teacher in a, a state in the north who has stage four cancer and is moving from her hospital room to her hospice room. Teaches third graders. And before they moved her to her hospice room, her third graders came to her hospital and sang over her. They sang hymns. Saw the picture of it. She's got a mask on. The kids all have masks on. An adult is leading them, and they're singing Christian hymns over her before she goes to hospice. Think about the power of that moment for those kids for the rest of their life. When they declared truth in agreement through song, because so, it, it, singing is an agreement. Singing is agreement. So think about the power of that moment as those children would never forget going and singing over their teacher who's on her way to heaven and blessing her with that before she goes. They'll never forget those words, those songs, that moment as they sang over that teacher. She'll never forget it. 
When you sing, you learn the Word of God. You declare the Word of God. There's something that goes on when you declare the Word of God in song. Third, you encourage others. Singing encourages people. Singing lifts the spirit of those who need lifting. More than a way that I, when I bless you, I pray for you, I can encourage you in my words, but when, when the minstrels break out in song, the encouragement factor goes up. Ephesians 5, 18 through 20 says, Do not get drunk with wine, in which there is debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. So the fruit of the Holy Spirit is speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. This is, by the way, a parallel passage to Colossians three sixteen, Same kind of teaching. Singing and making melody with your hearts to the Lord. Always giving thanks for all things. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and to our God. We're going to do that next weekend in our Thanksgiving service. We're going to, we're going to sing and make melody and tell, we're going to tell God thanks through word and through song. But when you hear that testimony and then you hear that song and you've been struggling with paying your bills or you're struggling in a marriage that's really hard or you're struggling with a chronic illness or you're struggling with unemployment or you're depressed about the state of our world and fear is creeping in and you hear some Christian next to you in church plant their feet and with the best voice they have just declare how great is our God. Then that go, you go, there's, there's a, a community of comfort in that. We, we rally each other. We encourage each other. We call each other to agreement when we start singing. That, that God still got it, and he's still in control, and it's going to be okay. When you sing, you encourage. You ready for the next one? When you sing, you wage war. When you sing, you, you, you fight. Some of you know what I'm talking about because it, sometimes it takes all you have to sing. And when you do, something happens. So in Second Chronicles, I referenced this last week, King Jehoshaphat is surrounded by invading marauders and he's like, we have to defend our land. <laughs> he turns to the choir and says, you go first. So they, they, he pulls, so verse 21 of Second Chronicles 20, when he consulted with the people, he appointed those who sang. Don't ever, please don't ever underestimate the power of a musician. Some of us write off creatives and musicians as, people that kind of are from Mars. He calls them those who sang. That was their job. David filled his temple, Solomon's temple. He instructed the tabernacle and the temple to have 24-hour praise going on, men and women singing to God all the time. He appointed those who sang to the Lord and to those who praised him in holy attire, and they went out before the army and said, give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness is everlasting. When they began singing and praising, the Lord set ambushes against the sons of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, who'd come against Judah, and they were struck down. The soldiers never drew their swords. The, the spiritual oxymoronic moment of war and singing created this Massive downdraft of the power of God. The wind shear of the power of God that just wiped out the opposing armies. And all Israel, or in this case Judah, had to do was sing. Now I want you to hear me as I go off script here just for a moment, which makes most people that know me really, really nervous, that when the demons are in your face, and when the devil is saying, you don't matter, and this is not going to turn out well, 
or God has abandoned you, or is God really good? Why would God keep this from you? When, you, when those lies are in your face, and the hopelessness and the despair and the grief and the oppression are welling up, something that will immediately break that demonic oppression is song. The, just the breaking, because the devil cannot stand worship. He hates it. It's terrifying, because God inhabits praise, the scripture says. You build a runaway of worship, God's going to land there. The devil doesn't like that. So the minute you start singing, uh-oh, we're in trouble. It really is an act of war. I don't mean war against man. I mean war against the spiritual forces of darkness in the heavenly places, Ephesians 6. There are some fights that cannot be done in the flesh, and, and demonic warfare is one of them. And you want to you fight hard, get on your knees and sing like crazy and watch what happens. Sing the scriptures, sing the truth of God, sing the hymns you know, sing the songs you know. Break out, when you're feeling shame and despair, just, despair, just break out in a good old round of amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me, Satan. Tell me something I don't know. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Get out of my face, in Jesus' name. You don't know the half of it. That's war. That's war. You have at your disposal, friends, an unbelievable ability to fight back and not, put, not be a punching bag for the devil. But it doesn't involve the kind of punching some of you are really good at. I do that and my shoulders hurt, by the way. Just doing that right there makes my shoulders hurt. Slow down, Will. You're going to hurt something. Finally, I'm going to spend a moment here. I need you to listen and think. Singing welcomes the Christ. And this is what I want to refer back to that moment we had a minute ago. Singing welcomes the Christ, the office. Jesus in his role as the Christ. He is unto you this day in the city of David, in the city of David is born to you a Savior. That's God's relationship to you who is the Christ, that's God's relationship to us, the Lord, that's God's relationship to the world. He's my Savior, he's our Christ, he's Lord of the universe. He's all three. There's a different dynamic between me and Jesus, the Savior, and us and Jesus, the Christ. He moves in ways and stirs in ways that are unique to the crowd where the Christ comes, the promised one ruling over his people that he does with just me and the, my quiet time. Both are great, but there's different roles he plays there. He's my Christ, he's, our, he's my Savior, he's our Christ. So here's a math, here's the kingdom math equation. I've taught you this before. Jesus in you, the Jesus in you plus the Jesus in me equals the Christ in us. I want you to learn that. In fact, let me say it again. I want you to say it with me. This is so important you get this. This is, this is really strong, important theology. I'll say it again. I'll say it first. The Jesus in you plus the Jesus in me equals the Christ in us. Say it with me. The Jesus in you plus the Jesus in me equals the Christ in us. That doesn't happen singular. There's, there's something powerful about the gathering that the Christ feels, the Christ, the one promised to his people. He's not the Christ to the unchurched people. He's the Christ to the church the spiritual Israel, and he has roles and duties and responsibilities and blessings he gives in that setting that he doesn't give in others. There's something about the plurality. It's why he says in Scripture, when you gather my name, I'm there. I'll show you that verse in just a second. So there's something really powerful that happens when a gathering begins to declare, then the Jesus in you and the Jesus in me activate, and the Christ now, the the demonstration of the plurality of his name shows up. And there's a power, and there's an anointing, and there's a healing and a blessing that comes that you don't find just me one-on-one. -on -one. There's something about the fire in you connecting with the fire in me. That's why it's so important, friends, that we gather. And that we go hard when we gather. We're not here to play games. We're not here to entertain you. 
We're here to engage and make war and encourage each other and sing the word of God and give the, the runway, build a runway that the Christ just might choose to land on. Because stuff happens when the Christ lands in your midst. There's a quote for you. Stuff happens. Kingdom stuff. So let me, can I be a pastor just for a minute? Please? I'm going to anyway, so. One of the wonderful things that's happened since COVID is the development of church online. And one of the not so wonderful things that's happened since COVID is the development of church online. The wonderful thing is there's given a lot of people the chance who can't get to church because of health reasons or traveling or other things, a chance to, to still be part of what's going on and feel some connection to their community. Another really great part of the COVID and internet church is guests show up now much more informed. When a guest shows up, they've been online, they've checked you out and they know the faces, they know the names and they, they have done their homework and they've maybe sat and worshiped with you for three or four weeks and okay, I'm gonna feel relatively safe here at this place and we're gonna hang in here. And that's really cool. The downside of church online is a lot of folks that have no reason to stay home had just decided they love church in their PJs and coffee at their dining room table not having to get up and come here and deal with the kids and they're just going to do church around the table, which, which is about half of what happens here. And it's this, it's, I want to say to you in the camera, it's, it's this moment where we experienced a minute ago, how great is our God? When something moved across the room and the goosebumps came and the tears came and the hands were raised, that the Christ entered the room and, and we all felt him come and something dynamic happened that you miss out when you're not with the gathering. And it's one of the negatives of COVID. And church online is a lot of Christians who just said, I just really like my living room. I'm going to do church there. And I'm not trying to be legalistic about this, but you're missing out by not being part of the Lord. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Most of you are in a small group, and that's great, but there's something even bigger that happens in a mass like this. And friends, remember how we all felt when COVID happened and we couldn't get to church and we thought, oh, I can't wait to get back to church again. Well, we can get back to church. Remember, they can't do this in China. They can't do this in China. They have to sing their hymns. We have such a privilege, such a God-given privilege that could be taken away tomorrow, by the way, of standing and singing as loud as we want to and encouraging each other and learning the word and affirming each other. And in the typical side effect of things that happen, some of us have decided, you know, I, I don't need to go. I just want to do it online. And, and that you're, you're, we miss you. We need you, but you need us too. Amen. You need this room. So come back. Come back next weekend for Thanksgiving. It's Amnesty Sunday at Austin Christian Fellowship. <laughs> no questions asked. Psalm 22, 3 says, yet you are holy, you who are enthroned. The praises of Israel, the praises of your people. The Christ is here. Matthew 18, 19, Matthew 18, 20 says, for where two or three have gathered together in my name. Gathered together in my name, I'm in their midst. And I believe that God shows up in small groups. I've taught that and believe it for years. He also shows up in the assembly in a different way. I can't tell you the number of times I've seen singing change a setting. One of my favorite moments was at a, a little youth camp I did. This is hard to believe, but years ago I was almost cool enough to speak to teenagers. A long time ago. And we did a night where the guys served the girl dinner and the girls served the guys dinner. And I spoke just to the guys one night, and I spoke just to the girls one night. I mean, the, the guys were in the room, but I had a message for the girls, and vice versa. I've done that here. And in a weird moment of inspiration, I, just, I was praying before this, during the worship. I was praying during the worship, and I thought I heard the Lord, and he gave me an idea. 
And so I had all the teenage guys stand up and surround the room. We didn't hear one time with the, with the men. Had all the girls sit in the middle. Had all the guys surround the room and lock arms, men, teenage men. As I was about to talk to the girls in the scripture, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Let's take the pressure off being a girl in this culture. You don't have to perform. You're perfect just the way you are. And I knew there was all kinds of junk going on. So we just, the men just prayed over them. The high school boys. We just prayed. And then we sang. And in the language of Philippians, or excuse me, what happened in Philippi in Acts chapter 16, everybody's chains fell off. That's when the breakthrough came. A bunch of waddy headed high school boys started singing out of key Amazing Grace over a bunch of performance driven high school girls. Then the breakthrough came. There's something to it, friends. My goal is to equip this church to sing, to take what happens. When we start this service at 9.30, the online at 10, or the next one at 11.15, that the house is full at that time because singing matters. It's not, it's not, it's not left over. It's not the, what you do to get to the message. It's, 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 it's church, and the message is optional. The worship is not. You know, you're aiming at that a little too hard, okay? Preaching is optional. It is. Worship is not. Then any preaching going on in heaven, there's a lot of worship going on. So guess what we're going to do? Whew! We're going to sing. We're going to sing a song that declares the eternity, the power of God. And some of you know it. If you don't know it, follow along as best you can. But let's, can we practice this? Can we wage war? Can we encourage each other? Can we engage our inner man? Can we sing the word of God? And can we see if the Christ just might make an appearance while we're here? Lord, we welcome you. We bless you. We sing to you in Jesus' name.
you guys have a seat just for a minute. You guys online, we love you. We miss you. We'll see you next week, either online or here in person. God bless you. Have a great Thanksgiving.